I'm glad to see that all, almost all of the seats are taken, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening uh, Bob Gruen. Bob lives in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Bob is from the famous Gruen family, which has a very long and rich history in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, some of you old timers might remember that his brother George was the first treasurer of AWI. I was telling Bob before that when I first came with AWI, George was no longer treasurer, but he was still very much interested. And so I, I had to send him our financial statement every year, and I'd send it in the mail to him. And first thing you know, about two or three days later, I'd get a phone call and he'd say, nope, you just got to stop spending more money than we take in. <laughs> so uh, uh, George was very good for AWI and good to AWI. And we were happy to have him on the board in the beginning. Uh, Bob Bruin came in a little later on and he got interested in our museum. He stopped by and he said, my goodness, with the Gruen Watch Company here in Cincinnati, you people don't have a good collection of Gruen Watches. So he set about uh, to correct that situation. And in the AWI Museum, we have a very fine collection of the Gruen Watches, a good representation of all of the watches that they manufactured over the years. And I might say that it's all to the generosity of Robert Gruen and uh, we are very grateful for it. I had the pleasure of hearing Robert present the uh, Ruin story about the long history of his family in the, in the business for a long, long time. It's a very interesting story, and I think you're going to be as interested as I was the first time that I heard it. I give you Robert Gruen. Thank you, Milt. It's nice to be here, and it's a real compliment to see so many people here, especially there's some people here who have heard that talk before, and if they fall asleep, that's perfectly all right. I'll be understood. Uh, first of all, I want to qualify myself, or rather, I want to disqualify myself. I'm not a horologist. I am not a watchmaker. My grandfather, Dietrich Gruen, my uncle, Frederick Gruen, my brother, George T. Gruen, they were all horologists. But... Uh, my father and I were trained in the sales and administrative end of the business, and probably everybody sitting in this room knows technically more about those watches than I do. The extent of my training in the horological end was uh, strip down a V4 17 jewel pocket watch, uh, clean it, oil it, and reassemble it so that I knew the difference between a hairspring and a mainspring. When you're in sales, you should know at least that much about the product you're selling. Now, what What's the history of the Gruen Watch Company? Dietrich Gruen was born in Germany. He was not a Swiss, as most people think, or as many people think. He was born in a little town of Usthofen, Germany, on the east bank of the Rhine River, just north of the cathedral city of Worms. And that was where Martin Luther was tried for heresy by the Catholic Church. Uh, after Dietrich completed his studies of horology under Martin at Freiburg, Germany, he worked for a while in uh, Switzerland to learn some more of the manufacturing technique and then came to America because his two older brothers were already over here in the shoe business in St. Louis. And uh, his father had a friend in Delaware, Ohio by the name of Whitlinger. And uh, Mr. Whitlinger was a watchmaker and had a retail jewelry store. He also had a very attractive daughter named Pauline who later became my grandmother. So Dietrich and uh, Pauline got married, and for a while Dietrich worked at the bench for his grandfather, but Dietrich was far more advanced in horology than his father-in-law was, and in December 22, 1874, he obtained a patent for an improved safety pinion. And on the very first watches, that date is shown. Uh, shortly after he uh, got this patent, he formed a partnership with a man named Savage, and they called the partnership Gruen and Savage, and they manufactured and sold watches under the name of the Columbus Watch Company, not the Gruen Watch Company. But on the plates of the watch were engraved Gruen's patented safety pinion, and the very first watch in the case there is a 
Columbus watch with that inscription on it, except the uh, engraver hadn't gone very far in school and he spelled safety, S-A-F-T-Y. So you see, uh, the manufacturers make mistakes even on the first product. But uh, at that time, the movements were basically Im were imported from uh, Switzerland, the complete movement. It was made by Leo Ashby in Switzerland in Beale. But then later, uh, they started making part of the watch in uh, Columbus. And by 1882, they built a sizable building there, had it completely equipped, and they were producing the complete watch, the complete Columbus watch in Columbus, Ohio. And that building still stands. It's used as a uh, plumbing supply house. Uh, the name of the street is different now than it was when it was originally built, but the building is still there. I haven't been in it, but I've been by the outside of it. Uh, the first line was uh, a 16 and 18 size pocket watch, and <clears throat> by standards of that day, it was a uh, rather modern design. And then when they started making the watches in uh, 1882 in Columbus, they made what I thought was kind of a retrogression. They made the type of watch that was being made in the United States with a balance cock up on the top of the rest of the movement, whereas the Swiss movements, the balance cock was uh, flat and parallel with the rest of the movement. So, uh, but that's what most of the American companies were doing, and so they made that. And they made a complete line of sizes, and they made them everywhere from seven jewels up to the beautiful 23 jewel Railroad King watches and things like that. And uh, in those days, they sold basically the watch itself with a dial on it, and the jeweler put the uh, case on the watch. Well, in uh, 1893, there was a depression in the United States called the Panic of 93. And that depression or panic was brought about to a large extent by the uh, gambling, if you would, or the speculation in railroad stocks that was going on with people like Gould and Fisk and so forth. And that brought about a, a financial crisis in the United States. And due to that financial crisis and a relatively under-financed uh, company, uh, my grandfather lost control of the uh, Columbus Watch Company and he put on his hat and walked out the door. And eventually the Columbus Watch Company was bought by the Studebaker family in South Bend, moved to South Bend, called the South Bend Watch Company, and their top of the line was then called the Studebaker a little later. So that uh, is what happened to the Columbus Watch Company. But the year after he lost the Columbus Watch Company, Dietrich Gruen, in conjunction with his oldest son, Frederick, started in business again as D. Gruen and Son, singular. And uh, Frederick Gruen, my uncle, had uh, gone to Ohio State University for one year and then went over to uh, Switzerland or to Germany and studied at Glossheda, Germany. At that, that time, that technical school was probably one of the most outstanding in Europe. And he graduated from the school there and became very closely associated with the Osman and the Grossman families over there. And uh, so Frederick and Dietrich went over there, and in conjunction with both Osman and Grossman, they designed a new line of what they called the D. Gruen and Son line. And I have one of those hunting case watches there. Uh, they were 16 and 18 size, later a 12 size and a 6 size. And the standard movement was 18 jewels, and the extra precision movement was 21 jewels. Why did they make an 18 jewel movement? Well, it was uh, what you call, I believe, a three-quarter plate movement. And by putting the 18th cap jewel on there, the 18th jewel is a cap jewel on the escape wheel, you could take that cap jewel off, then you could lift the escape wheel out, and then you could do anything you wanted to the escapement without having to disturb any of the rest of the train. And I understand in those days that a lot of problems in watches were involved, the mainspring and the train, and uh, that way you could service one part of the watch without disturbing the other. But a lot of people thought that 18th jewel was just put on there for cosmetic purposes to make it look like a 19th jewel if you didn't look down below. Uh, they were a very high quality watch. In fact, some people think it was maybe the finest watch we ever made. Osman and Grossman were recognized as excellent horologists. Uh, but it was a standard railroad type size watch. And, uh, Dietrich Gruen always felt that those watches were too large, and he was interested in making a smaller, thinner watch, and a watch that had more style to it. But one of the innovations that they started when they started as a, 
as a growing company, was to sell the complete product. They didn't sell just the movement. They sold the movement. It was cased, and it was put in a display box for the jeweler. Now, that's very rudimentary today, but in those days, most of the watches were sold just as a movement with a dial and the hands on it, and the local jeweler would go to Keystone or whoever he wanted and buy a case, or he might buy the case direct from Elgin and Waltham, something like that. But uh, Gruen decided they were going to do it that way. They were going to sell the whole product complete, and they did that. But uh, after they'd been manufacturing the D. Gruen line about two years, and my father, who was the younger of the two brothers, the middle of the three brothers actually, uh, joined and they changed the name to D. Gruen and Sons, plural, and that actually remained the uh, corporate name until 1922 when it was changed to D. Gruen and to, to, was changed to the Gruen Watch Company. Uh, they stayed in Columbus, Ohio till 1898, and I don't know the exact date they moved, but I have a, a, an envelope direct a, address to D. Gruen and Son in August of 1898 in Columbus, and I have a letter addressed to them in Cincinnati in uh, October of 1898, so sometime between August and October they moved, and what that direct date is, I don't know. Now, why did they move from Columbus? Uh, they bought the Queen City Case Company in Cincinnati, who were manufacturers of high-quality 14-carat cases, gold cases, and they changed the name to the Gruen National Watch Case Company and you'll find some of the older models have the GWCC stamped on the inside of it. And uh, so then since their case company was in Cincinnati, and they thought there was more of a facility there, it was a larger city than Columbus, they moved the company down here and they took office space in what was then called the Johnson Building, which is where the Gibson Hotel used to be, which is where the Fifth Third and the Western, Fifth Third Bank and the Western Hotel is now located. And they operated out of this relatively small facility for years, but uh, the company prospered. In 1911, they started their first national advertising program with a full-page ad in the Saturday Evening Post. And J. Walter Thompson, the leading advertising firm in the country, was uh, their selection. And they uh, got ruined to commit to $50,000 worth of advertising. He said, now, you can't go in and run one ad and expect people to come flocking. He says, you got to advertise for a year, for two years, for three years before you really feel it. And they thought, my gosh, you're going to spend $50,000 on a bunch of printing and a magazine, you know? <laughs> Who knows what you're going to get out of that? But they followed a very vigorous program and it prospered. So uh, Gruen was selling direct to the dealers. They did not sell through the wholesalers. They, went, they had their salesmen called directly on the retail jewelry store. They sold uh, parts and materials through the material houses, of course, as well as direct to the dealers. Now, what were they doing with the line mechanically? Uh, Dietrich Gruen wanted a thinner, smaller watch, as I said, a more attractive watch. And uh, unfortunately, he died at sea in 1911, just before the new uh, uh, deluxe line came out. They had introduced the very thin line, which was became the more or less standard watch line for Gruen for many years. They had introduced that about 1910, but uh, that was a, oh, like a Buick and an Oldsmobile would be, and he had an idea for a, like a Cadillac uh, in the watch field. And he died before that got into production, so when they brought it out, they called it the Dietrich Gruen. It was a 23-jewel movement in a 18-carat uh, case with a dust cover and an up-down indicator, and I have one of those in the case over there. Uh, he died at sea, as I said, on an Italian boat coming back from Switzerland. And uh, he had been on that boat several times before and was a friend of the sea captain, the captain of the ship. And if it hadn't been for that, why well, he would have been wrapped in a piece of canvas and buried at sea because they didn't have any refrigeration in those days on board ship. But the captain said, well, I want to bring him back to New York. And I think they put him in a cask of either wine or alcohol, like they did Admiral Nelson, and brought him back to New York City, where he was embalmed, and then brought to Cincinnati. And he's buried in Spring Grove Cemetery here in Cincinnati. So Dietrich finally got home to his resting place. But uh, then this Dietrich Gruen was the top of the line. And I have there the up-down indicator, and I have a, a minute repeater in there. 
Uh, they also made a chronograph minute repeater combination, but I have never found one of those. If anybody has one in their pocket, I'd like to see it. I'm surprised that Dana doesn't have one in his collection. Uh, Gruen tried to merchandise wristwatches prior to World War I with very indifferent success. <clears throat> the American male uh, looked upon the wristwatch as a sissy thing. Now that's something a Frenchman would wear. No red-blooded American would wear a wristwatch, you know. Until they got overseas in World War I, and all the French and all the English officers and chief non-commissioned officers all wore wristwatches because, you know, they had these coordinated attacks where you had to know it was 1102 or whatever. And a pocket watch was rather impractical. As soon as World War II was over, why well, you couldn't make men's wristwatches fast enough. Now, the ladies' watches had been, wristwatches had been popular from the early teens, or even before that. We, I have one ladies' watch in there. It's engraved in 1909. It could be a, it's a convertible model, which could be worn on a pin or around your neck on a chain, or it could be fixed with a bracelet or a, a ribbon strap on the wrist. The, that type of watch was convertible, which could be worn three basic ways. So ladies wore wristwatches for a long time before men did, and that was the accepted thing. Uh, Gruen did not make all of their watch movements, uh, just like General Motors does not make all the parts when you, of the car that you buy from them or Ford or any other company. Uh, <clears throat> when business was real good, in our own factory in Beale, Switzerland, and there's a picture of that factory in there, they made just the precision movements. That was the top of the line, the best wristwatch, pocket watch movements. And then they bought uh, wristwatch and pocket watch movements from other people uh, that were specialists in making watches for uh, other brand names. We made watches movements for Rolex, and Rolex made movements for us. There are certain watches that you can take the mainspring out of the Rolex and put it in the groove, and you can take the center wheel out of the groove and put it in the Rolex, and the both watches will run fine. Absolutely the same except for the name on the dial. And at one time, there was a move on foot to uh, merge the two companies together, but when the Depression came along, those plans fell through. Rolex at that time did not have very good representation in the United States, but uh, they wanted it, and they thought that'd be a good way to get it but that didn't materialize. Uh, <clears throat> the Depression came along, and as everybody knows, that affected the watch and the jewelry industry because a watch or a piece of jewelry was a sort of a luxury item, but the watch end of the business held up much better than the uh, diamond did. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the retail jewelers had a large diamond inventory that they had to pay off, and they would buy watches from Gruen and Elgin and people like that and take the profit from that and pay off their diamond bills, and as a result, some of the watch companies suffered as a result of it, but eventually we got through that. One of the uh, innovations that was introduced in the middle 1930s was a wristwatch called the Curvex, and that was probably the most revolutionary design of its time. It was a curved movement in a curved case, and that design set a whole new standard for the men's wristwatch uh, industry, and everybody copied it. Within uh, six months, Bulova had one they called the Bulova President, but it had a flat movement in it. And these movements, the first ones were curved on the top and flat on the bottom, and the second ones were really curved like that. So you see some of these curvex that look like this, and uh, those movements were curved top and bottom. And they carried that curvex line on for quite a few years with a total of four different series of movements. Uh, Charlie Cleese back there has a half a dozen or a dozen of each of those four models in his safe there at home. He won't part with them. Uh, we uh, also made the ladies' Curvex, which uh, had a somewhat curved movement for the ladies' case. And uh, I have two examples in there. One is extremely curved, and the ladies wore it on the side of the wrist, and the other one isn't curved that much, and it was worn on the flat on the top of the wrist. Um, how did we uh, do all this business? We not only did business in the United States selling direct to the office in Canada, so we did business in most of the uh, Central America and some of the South American countries. We also had a, an arrangement over in Europe called the Alpina Gruen Guild, and they sold uh, 
Gruen watches with the name Alpina Gruen on the dial in Europe, uh, mainly in Germany and Switzerland and Austria. We didn't seem to do too much business in France or as much business in France and England as we did in these other countries. So we had an international uh, business uh, selling all around the world and we're doing very well until the depression hit and then they got into some financial trouble but they finally got out of that. Um, as I said, they were strong on merchandising, they were strong on design, and they pushed that in their advertising, and uh, that helped prosper the company. Now, uh, the basic watch designs were somewhat like everybody else's. Other than that Curvex, I don't think there was anything revolutionary in any of our watch designs. We had uh, some movements that were better than others. Uh, some of you men that are watchmakers are asking me, well, why did you make a so-and-so that had such a weak balance there? Don't ask me. <laughs> I wasn't there then uh, to do that. Uh, uh, people ask me, well, what was your connection with a watch company? Well, my father, of course, was a, of German heritage, and he believed in getting children started off early. And so about the summer that I was in the sixth grade, I was the office boy over there. And you open the mail and distribute the mail and run the errands and do things like that. And so each summer in grade school and high school, I worked at the factory there, mostly just in the office doing routine things. Then I went to the University of Cincinnati as a co-op, uh, you know, the system where you go to school for six or eight weeks, then go to work for six or eight weeks. And that's a five-year course. And at the end of that five years, I'd worked in every department there, uh, from the shipping department, uh, the sales department, uh, casing department. I worked in the case factory. We had our own case factory there and uh, ran the punch presses and did things like that. Uh, we had our own crystal manufacturing department which uh, made all of our crystals for new production as well as for sending out for replacement. And uh, incidentally one interesting thing that they had there when they first opened the plant, now this is back in 1917, there were no computers in those days and uh, so forth. But they came up with an idea for communication with a Swiss plant. Mail would take anywhere from two to three to four weeks to get from Cincinnati to New York. On the uh, third floor of the building, they set up what they called the wireless room. Well, well, we'd call it a radio room. But it was a key radio, a diddy da as we called it in the Army. And uh, every morning at 8 o'clock, they would send a message over to Switzerland. And I think it's six hours difference, so that would be about 2 o'clock in the afternoon over in Switzerland. And he would be keyed over there, and he'd be listening in, and he'd write down these messages. And then uh, at a certain time every day, Switzerland would send a message back to us. Yesterday, we shipped you X number of Model 810, X and so many models of this, that, and the other. And then we would confirm all of those by writing. But uh, that seems, well, that seems kind of basic today. But that was just as modern in that day as having a direct computer link up would be today. Today, you have a little computer and you type something out and five minutes later it's printed over there in Switzerland. Well, we were doing the same thing except you wrote it out uh, one letter at a time on a, on a Keys uh, radio set. Uh, then we had to shut that down for a while during World War I because they were afraid that the messages might be sent, you know, that weren't proper. And then we started to back up again after World War I. But then when the uh, uh, transatlantic telephone lines became more available, then we dropped that and just used the telephone and so forth. But they always confirmed every message by mail. Even when we started using air mail, we'd always send a copy of the letter by regular uh, surface mail. Uh, in uh, 1951, uh, the fam 1953, the family sold their interest in their Gruen Watch Company to a group of financial people from Milwaukee, or from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the man that was behind it was a man by the name of Rickless, who was a refugee from Germany in uh, the beginning of World War One and he World War Two, and he was a uh, professor of economics up there, and he had talked to some of the wealthy men in Minneapolis and said, you know. There's just all kind of opportunities for making big money here in the United States. And they said, well, if you're so smart, why haven't you made any money? Well, he said, you know, as a college professor, in those days, uh, making maybe $10,000 a year or 15000 is about all they were making back in 1950. 
He said, I don't have the ability to accumulate the capital. So they backed him and he bought a company in Cincinnati called Ball Crank, who made automotive parts. And uh, that was one of the first companies they bought. And when they were down here, somebody said, I think you ought to look into the Gru and Watch Company. He said, uh, I think that company's undervalued. So they did, and they made a pass at us, and we sold their stock. Well, about uh, a year ago, he was interviewed on TV. Uh, this man is now in his 80s, and he's got a young starlet as his wife, who everybody says is not much of an actress, but she had a play produced or movie produced. Anyway, they're interviewing him, because he's a, he's a billionaire by now, and they said, uh, Mr. Rickless, you've had all these wonderful successes in the business world. Have you ever had a reverse? And he thought for me, he says, yes. He said, I bought the crew and watch company. <laughs> because he bought it in 19, he and his associates bought it in 1953. And in 1958, they moved the uh, company to New York City. And then like Hamilton and Elgin and Volvo and Waltham and the rest of the companies, they went through some reverses and uh, four or five ownerships until the present people have it. Uh, something that most people don't know is that Gruen manufactured movements here in the Cincinnati area as well as the cases. Uh, starting about 1950, they imported machinery from Switzerland and they made a series of 17 and 21 jewel wristwatch movements. I have one of the 21 jewel wristwatches there and a 17 and 21 jewel ladies watch. And uh, so then we had the capability of making movements and the case, the complete watch right here in the United States, which we did. But when these new owners moved to New York, they abandoned the case company, sold all the machinery. They abandoned the watch production, sold all that machinery, and moved to New York. And the uh, picture was entirely different. Uh, who owns Gruen Watch Company today? Well, this is not a 1935 uh, Curvex. This is a modern reproduction. It's in 14 karat with a high quality Swiss Etta movement. Uh, it is owned by the people. It's called Gruen Marketing Corporation. It's owned by the people who own Jewel Corps in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And uh, they have done very well with the company. I have a few figures here. I'm not connected with the company, so I'm not pushing it. In 19... Uh, 86, they did $104 million. In 1988, they did $137 million. And in 1989, I understand they did considerably better than that. That was their best year by far. In addition to selling Gruen watches, they sell watches under about 15 different names. You go into a store and they sell Pierre Cardin watches and the so-and-so watch and so forth. Well, none of those companies, of course, are in the watch business. And Gruen has these watches provided with their name on it and they sell it. Uh, they also are an importer of the Seiko watch uh, line and uh, some other watches like that. So they're a very large and at the present time a very successful operation. But they're all uh, offshore movements. They're, now they're getting them all from Switzerland. Originally they got some of the movements from Hong Kong. I've got one there that's a five jewel Hong Kong movement and uh, the other ones are 15 jewel uh, Swiss ETA movements, good quality. Now that about covers the uh, basic things I really wanted to talk about. Uh, well, one of the watches that I wanted to cover that I forgot to mention was in 1924 when the company was 50 years old, they introduced the Gruen 50th anniversary watch. And I have a, I'm hooked up here to something. I have a beautiful example of it in this uh, leather box here. And that's the original type of box that that watch was shipped in in 1924. Uh, the box was made in Switzerland also out of crushed calf and gold tooling around there. The last time I saw one of those in the Mart, they were asking $500 for the box. Uh, in 1924, the basic 500, uh, the basic 50th anniversary watch sold for $500. That was in a 14 karat case. The movement is a 17 line, the plates are 12 karat gold, they tried to make it out of 14, it was just a little bit too soft, they scrapped those and melted them and melted them down to 12 karat. Uh, 21 ruby jewels and 2 diamond jewels, the cap jewels on the escape wheel are diamonds. Uh, they made 500 of them, uh, they made 600 of them, one for each month they were in business, and they made 50 more, one for each year they were made in business. They were in business. 
Now, the basic watch, I said, sold for $500, but that was in a in a 14-carat uh, case with just a snap bezel and a snap back. They came with hinge backs, they came with dust covers, they came with exhibition glass, they came 18-carat, they became they came available in platinum, they became available in platinum with diamonds around the side. But $500 doesn't sound much for a watch today, but back there in those days, in 1924, there were people raising families on $20 a week. To give you an idea, I've got a list here of 1924 prize prices taken from the Saturday Evening Post. An Ingersoll watch cost $3. A West Clock alarm clock cost a dollar and a half. Palm olive soap, 10 cents. Coca-Cola, 5 cents. Uh, Cinco cigars, two for 15. A vacuum cleaner, $42. Crosley radio, $30. A crane water heater, 125. A washing machine, 137. A Steinway piano, $875. Uh, we were selling watches at a higher price than a Steinway. A Chevrolet cost less than $500, and an Essex, which was made by Hudson, cost $975. But I think the funniest thing of all from a price standpoint, there was a company called Aladdin Homes, and they made prefabricated wooden houses. And uh, you got the complete house shipped in a truck, or really a boxcar, and a set of plans, and you put the house together yourself on your own foundation you could get a five-room house prefabricated, which you assemble. The five-room house was $548. The seven-room house was $1,298. And the 12-room house was $1,932. Now, that gives you an idea of the comparison of the price. So a $500 watch in 1924 was a very expensive watch. And there weren't too many people that bought those. A lot of those watches were given as presentations. General Pershing got it, Lindbergh got it, you name it. A lot of the heads of industry got were awarded that watch or were given the watch or bought the watch. Uh, as I mentioned, in 1922, the name of the company was changed to uh, the Gruen Watch Company, and they absorbed the Gruen National Watch Case Company, and they absorbed the Gruen Watch Manufacturing Company of Switzerland. They were at one time three separate corporations, and they became one. And then in, uh, during the Korean War, or just before the Korean War, uh, they started making defense products. And during the Korean War, Gruen was the largest manufacturer of time fuses for the armed forces. And of course, that's like a basic little watch or a clock mechanism. The soldier twists it so far and it'll go off in one second or 10 seconds or 30 seconds, whatever you want. And uh, so they changed the name of the company to Gruen Industries and then the Gruen Watch Company became a subsidiary of Gruen Industries. And that was the name of the company uh, as it uh, went through its final years, and now it's known as Gruen Marketing Company. Now, I have talked long enough, and I will be glad to answer questions uh, that you people might have of a general nature, and I'll also be glad to stay up here afterwards and uh, talk to you about individual pieces or individual questions you might have. Anything else? If not, well, thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed being here.